and let me introduce our first speaker. <clears throat> our first speaker is Mariam Mimar Sadegi. She's a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. She has over 20 years of international civil society capacity building experience, including three years of post-conflict work in the Balkan region. She's a 2017 presidential leadership scholar and an acclaimed advocate for democracy, civic education, internet freedom, and women's rights, particularly in the Islamic context. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and other major publications. She was born in Tehran and emigrated to the United States shortly after the revolution uh, in Iran in 1979. Mariam, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Hillel. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to bring attention to the lack of freedom and equality for the women of Iran and bring uh, the spotlight and scrutiny on even Western democracies who think it's okay to legitimize the regime that oppresses them. I'm grateful to UN Watch and uh, the McNaughton uh, Laurier Institute and the Raoul Wallenberg Center. And it's an honor to be with my fellow panelists. To many, the United Nations represents a force for human dignity and progress, but the reality of the UN today is a far cry from its historic commitment to freedom and equality. It is an open secret, in fact, that the global body has devolved into a primary mechanism for the world's most brutal regimes to legitimize and sustain their rule. A most glaring example concerns my homeland, Iran, where women are subject to among the world's most sexist laws. One would hope the UN would work to punish a gender apartheid state like Iran for its infringements of women's equality and lend a helping hand to women's rights activists there. Not so. Instead, the Islamic Republic of Iran has been elected by the UN to serve a four-year term on its commission on the status of women. The, quote, principal global intergovernmental body exclusively dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. This is a mockery. It is akin to electing apartheid South Africa to a commission on the elimination of racism. A nation that once led the Middle East in advancing women's equality is today ruled by an Islamist theocracy that denies girls and women their most basic rights, one that commits violence, rape, sexual harassment, discrimination, and confinement upon them. Girls are separated from boys in school in all spheres of life, taught literally they are worth half a man. Domestic violence and marital rape are legally permitted, and rates of punishment for so-called honor killings are disproportionately small. The parliament of so-called moderates recently raised the age of marriage for girls to 13 and still allows marriage of girls as young as nine with a judge's order. Every day, women and girls are subject to forced veiling, segregation, and humiliation in public life. For women, there is similarity between the medieval practices of Iran and the policies unleashed by ISIS. Only in Iran, these egregious human rights violations are perpetrated by a regime with a seat at the UN and a foreign minister, Javad Zarif, many Western diplomats are all too eager to embrace. Even some Western democracies voting by secret ballot have elected to include Iran in the commission. That, that all this coincides with the active appeasement of the regime by many world powers is not an accident. The Biden administration has joined Canada and Europe in a most disciplined reticence to criticize the Islamic Republic's mounting repression in the hope that the lack of scrutiny will be seen by the regime as another concession to curb its nuclear program. Feminists in the West, meanwhile, have also taken what amounts to an oath of silence about this all too obvious affront to their purported convictions. Microaggressions on college campuses and correct use of gender pronouns elicit more attention than millions of Iranian women denied the most basic rights of their oppressors. Sisterhood, so it seems, is not global. The regime is welcome to the commission while the UN's own secretary general and special rapporteurs have documented time and again the serious violations of women's rights in Iran as well as the violation of human rights more broadly. To this day, it is no wonder why Iran is one of only a handful of countries that has refused to ratify the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. 
This is by no means the first time Ayatollah Khamenei's cabal has derided the UN and been rewarded for its brutality. In the past, Saeed Mortazavi, a chief prosecutor personally culpable for brutal, brutal interrogations and torture of dissidents, led Iran's delegation to the UN Human Rights Council. At the regime's as the regime sits on a commission meant to advocate equality for women and girls, it will hold in its dungeons courageous women's rights activists like Sabal Kordafshori, who at age 23 is serving a 24 year prison sentence for demanding women's rights to dress as they choose. If what could reasonably be called the world's most sexist regime belongs on a commission devoted to the elimination of sexism, what is the UN good for exactly? The UN was formed in large part as a response to the rise of fascism. What hope do Iranians and others struggling for freedom and equality have for moral solidarity from the international community if the world's chief international organization betrays them? The latest travesty at the UN is an insult not only to the women of Iran, but to the democratic world's most exalted values. Thank you, Mariam, for your powerful testimony and remarks. And um, it's, it's really hard to make sense of what happened 